These are the first moments of freedom for Kevin Strickland after spending 43 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Strickland leaving a Missouri prison in a wheelchair, describing his disbelief. Well, I didn't think this day was going to come. I mean, not before I got this legal team, I didn't. He was wrongfully convicted in 1979 for a triple murder, but always maintained his innocence, including when I spoke to him earlier this year. Pain at the pump as millions hit the road for Thanksgiving. And the average price of gas soared to $3.40 a gallon. Now President Biden is taking action, tapping into 50 million barrels in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, while also acknowledging the sticker shock Americans are feeling this holiday season. So is relief on the way? Verdict watch in Georgia as the jury begins deliberations in the case of Ahmad Aubrey and the three men accused of chasing Aubrey down in a pickup truck and fatally shooting him. The point prosecutors drove home in their closing argument. In Wisconsin tonight, the man accused of plowing into Christmas parade goers in Waukesha making his first appearance in court. Authorities now call it an intentional act to hurt as many people as possible. This new surveillance video appears to show him pleading for help just after the rampage. And a sixth victim, a child, has now died. Burn pit outrage. The soldiers who served on the front lines in war zones now face a health fight at home. As evidence mounts that exposure to toxic fumes may lead to serious illness several years later. What the White House is trying to do in response. Did anyone ever warn you about these burn pits? I definitely didn't know that I would leave my deployment with exposure risks. Inside the mega drought, as California suffers through its driest year in nearly a century, with more than 90% of the state facing severe drought conditions and reservoirs at record low levels, we take a closer look at the impact on farmers and the food we eat. And planetary protection. It may read like science fiction, but NASA is on a mission to slam a small spacecraft into an asteroid six million miles away and maybe alter its course. The countdown to launch is on. So could this one day protect Earth from Armageddon? What we really want to do here is to test this technique so that in the future, if a potential asteroid ever became a threat, that we would be prepared. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with some welcome news. Actually, bittersweet, you might say. A moment decades in the making for a story that we've been following for some time here on ABC News Prime. 43 years after entering a Missouri prison, after being convicted in a triple murder that prosecutors now say he did not commit, Kevin Strickland is finally free, exonerated today by a Missouri judge. This is the moment that he thought might never come for the man at the center of one of the longest wrongful conviction cases in U.S. history. And while the record has finally been set straight for Strickland, just in the past week, we've gotten some painful reminders of Americans who went to the grave without any recognition that they were, in fact, innocent. Monday, a judge in Florida posthumously exonerated four black men known as the Groveland Four, who were falsely accused of raping a white woman in the Florida town of Groveland in 1949. And last week, nearly 57 years after the assassination of civil rights activist Malcolm X, two men convicted in connection with his killing were exonerated. Only one of them is still alive. In a statement, Mohammed Aziz said, I hope the same system that was responsible for this travesty of justice also takes responsibility for the immeasurable harm that it caused me. Strickland, who is now 62, may share similar sentiments tonight. When he entered prison, he could walk. He now relies on a wheelchair. When we spoke with him in jail earlier this year and asked him what justice might look like, he said, I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I know you. It's been a long 43 year fight for Kevin Strickland, but tonight he can finally say he's a free man. Still in disbelief. No, I didn't think this day was going to come. Today, Missouri Judge James Welsh ordered his immediate release, ending one of the longest wrongful convictions in U.S. history. I was actually watching a soap opera, and it. <laughs> <laughs> thing went across news break or whatever they call them and and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. So that's how you learned? That's how I learned. The 62 year old took the stand to testify at the start of an evidentiary hearing, finally getting a chance at freedom, one he's been waiting for for decades. 
Strickland was convicted by an all-white jury in 1979, despite having an alibi and no physical evidence linking him to the crimes. He's remained adamant about his innocence all along. A few fellas pled guilty to this triple murder, is that right? I know about that. And uh, I guess I just have to ask, um, why didn't you plead guilty? I wasn't about to plead guilty to a crime I had absolutely nothing to do with. Wasn't going to do it. His case for exoneration largely hung on this crucial piece of evidence. The most important piece of evidence was a recantation of a witness. She has since died, um, but she really did a good job documenting um, her recantation. So we believe it to be a very credible recantation. Back in May, Jackson County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker announced that her office found Strickland innocent. So to Mr. Strickland, I am profoundly sorry for the harm um, that has come to you. But at the time, Missouri law prevented her from being able to release him or bring his case before a judge. When we spoke with Baker back in June, she did not mince words. Let's just call it what it is. This is wrong. And everyone that works in this system must find a way to do the right thing now. The right thing is getting Mr. Strickland out. Strickland's first exoneration hearing was held two weeks ago after a new law passed in August allowed Baker to file a petition on his behalf. Mr. Strickland, you have a lot riding on this hearing, is that right? The remainder of my life. Strickland's family, who attended the proceedings, has been anxiously awaiting the decision. It's been like a heartbreaking for us just devastating. But today, with Thanksgiving just days away, his brother tells the Kansas City Star that he cannot wait to see him to say, welcome home, brother. Strickland will not receive any compensation from Missouri. State law prevents exonerees who cannot prove their innocence through DNA from receiving compensation. When we visited Strickland in jail this summer, we asked him what he would do if this day ever came. So what do you do? How do you start over your life at 62 and no money. You know, I, I kind of jokingly talked about that recently with a friend of mine. I guess I give me a, a cardboard box and uh, get up under the bridge somewhere. Is that really, that's how you're going to start, you feel? I mean, what, what do I have? I mean, and, and I mean, if they were to tell me roll out now, they'd take this chair. I had to crawl out the front door. I have nothing. Under Missouri law, um, those who have been exonerated um, do not get compensation. It's another wrong, um, I believe, in Missouri's system, system and one that should be corrected. And are there efforts underway to, to correct this? Well, there are by this office, uh, the one that I'm seated in now, the one that I lead, yes. But these efforts will not be in time to help Mr. Strickland. Instead, he has to rely on nonprofits and GoFundMe pages, like the one the Midwest Innocence Project has created. When we spoke with him in June, he was hopeful he'd see his ailing mother if he got out. It's going to be the first thing you do if and when you get out. Well, I mean, I hate people to hear a 62-year-old man say this, but I'm a mama's boy, and I got to go see mom. I got to go my whole mama's hand, yeah. But Strickland never got that wish. Procedural hurdles caused his case to be delayed and later dismissed. His mother passed away on August 21st. It does show just how incredibly difficult this process is. Even when the prosecutor is on your side, it took months and months for Mr. Strickland to come home. And he's still going to come home to a system that will not provide him any compensation for the 43 years that he's lost. That's not justice. Although Mr. Strickland has had to endure decades in a criminal justice system that has largely failed him, losing his best years and was denied the chance to freely hug his mother and say goodbye, now free, he gets the chance to finally fulfill one lifelong wish. Any bucket list item that you, that you dream of, of being able to do? You know, I've never been on a beach, you know, not, not even a man-made beach. And I want to go out far in the ocean where you can't see any land any direction and not just go out there but get in that water i want to feel the power you know of god's creation i want to feel that water we hope he gets there the governor of missouri had multiple opportunities to pardon strickland he refused and said pardoning him would not be a quote
priority. Moving on now to Waukesha, Wisconsin, where Daryl Brooks, the 39-year-old accused of ramming an SUV into Christmas parade goers, made his first appearance in court. He's already facing five counts of intentional homicide, but during his hearing, prosecutors revealed a sixth victim, this time a child, has died. ABC's Alex Perez reports in tonight from Wisconsin. Tonight, with hands shackled and wearing what appeared to be a bulletproof vest, the man police say plowed into crowds at a Christmas parade in Waukesha, making his first appearance in court. 39-year-old suspect Daryl Brooks audibly sobbing in court when prosecutors announced a child had died and that they intend to charge him with six counts of intentional homicide. I wish to notify the court, sadly, that today we learned of another death of a child. A newly released criminal complaint saying an officer observed Brooks looking straight ahead directly at him and it appeared he had no emotion on his face when he plowed into parade goers and participants honking as officers yelled for him to stop. Authorities say the SUV appeared to rapidly accelerate and turn into the crowd, injuring 62 people. An officer saying it was clear this was an intentional act to strike and hurt as many people as possible. The nature of this offense is shocking. And tonight we're getting our first look at Brooks moments after the deadly chaos. This doorbell cam video capturing him knocking on a homeowner's door about a half mile from the parade route asking for help with a ride. Hey. Can I, I call some, I call the Uber and I'm supposed to be waiting for it over here, but I don't know when it's coming. Can you call it for me, please? Minutes later, police arriving, arresting him. We're also learning new details about the six killed, three of them part of the Dancing Granny's marching group. Those three were marching right next to Dancing Granny Sharon Millard. She narrowly escaped, still in shock after finding her marching partner nearby. No one could find her anywhere, and as soon as everything cleared out, most people were gone. I spotted her, and you could just see her blue dress tied against the doorway. Hearing those little details makes it even all the more unbearable. Alex Perez joins us now for more. And Alex, how is the city of Waukesha coping with the shock of this attack that, that struck at the very core of this community? Yeah, Lindsay, as you heard in our piece there, shock is really what a lot of people are feeling right now, but they're trying to come together. I want you to take a look behind me here. This is a growing memorial for the victims. A lot of people stopping by here to honor them. This is one way they're paying respect to those who died, Lindsay. Yeah, we see them bringing candles and flowers. Uh, we know there's a suspect, Daryl Brooks, has a long criminal record. What can you tell us about the bail conditions the judge set? Yeah, Lindsay, the judge set bail at $5 million, which is extraordinarily high. Here in Wisconsin, you can't be held uh, without bail. The prosecutor called Brooks a flight risk. He did not enter a plea just yet. He's due back in court in January. Lindsay? Alex Perez, thanks so much. Ahead of what's expected to be an expensive holiday season, President Biden announced a new step to lower gas prices by releasing oil reserves. But when exactly will Americans be able to feel less pain at the pump and beyond? Our Rachel Scott has those details. With Americans preparing for what could be the most expensive Thanksgiving yet, President Biden taking action today to blunt some of the pain at the pump. The bottom line. Today, we're launching a major effort to moderate the price of oil, an effort that will span the globe and its reach and ultimately reach your, cor your corner gas station, God willing. For drivers, relief can't come soon enough. In just the past year, the average price for a gallon of gas has soared to $3.40. That's $1.29 higher than this time last year. Just fill up my car, it's like $65. Khadija Baxter and her four kids usually drive to spend Thanksgiving with family, but not this year. Riding around is a no. You have to fill up again by the end of the week. Today, the president tapping into the nation's emergency reserve to help, releasing 50 million gallons of crude oil. The fact is we always get through those spikes, but we're going to get through this one as well and hopefully faster. But it doesn't mean we should just stand by idly and wait for prices to drop on their own. I pressed the Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm, on when Americans will feel the impact. So bottom line, how soon will Americans see prices at the pump drop and how long do you expect that to last? It won't happen tomorrow, 
but it'll happen over the next few weeks that people hopefully will start to see the difference. The administration acutely aware that inflation combined with shipping delays is hitting families hard. Today, word the shipping logjam may be easing. ABC's Kana Whitworth reports there's 33% less cargo sitting on the docks at the Port of Los Angeles, the nation's busiest. Port officials creating relief yards to house empty shipping containers, making space for new ones to be unloaded. And as this relief yard is already nearing capacity, they're looking to open another one right across the street to hold an additional 6,000 containers. Officials say the progress is clear to see. Two weeks ago, 101 ships waiting at the port. Today, that number down to 63. Good to hear some progress is being made. Rachel Scott joins us now from the White House. And Rachel, when was the last time that the U.S. actually had to tap into our oil reserves? Well, it doesn't happen that often, Lindsay. The last time was actually in 2011. And the big question on everyone's mind tonight is when they're actually going to feel the drop at the pumps. It will take 13 days for that oil to make its way out of the emergency reserve. But economists say the markets are already reacting. So Americans could expect to see those uh, lower prices even sooner, maybe within a matter of a couple of days, Lindsay. Good news. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. A dark moment in American history has closed a chapter after a verdict was reached in the civil trial against the extremists who took over Charlottesville in 2017. The victims are expected to receive millions. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, a jury in Virginia holding the white supremacists and neo-Nazi organizers liable for the violence at their Charlottesville rally that turned deadly in August 2017. I think this verdict today is a message that this country does not tolerate violence based on racial and religious hatred in any form. Jurors awarding over $25 million in civil damages to nine victims, including several caught in the carnage as a racist rammed his car into a crowd, killing Heather Heyer. Charlottesville became ground zero for the nation's racial tension as a debate erupted over whether a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee should remain. The neo-Nazi who killed Heyer was convicted of murder, but Heyer's mother has long wanted the organizers of the white nationalists to face justice as well. I hope that not only are they bankrupted, but I hope that other groups realize that there are dire consequences to their actions. Pierre Thomas joins us now. And Pierre, there were also some conspiracy charges against the extremists. What came of that? Listen, the jury deadlocked on federal conspiracy charges, but did find a conspiracy under a Virginia state law that allows for civil damages for racial or religiously motivated harassment and violence. Pierre Thomas, thank you. Pleasure. We shift now to the trial over the death of Ahmad Aubrey. The prosecution presented their closing rebuttal before jurors went into deliberations, which have now concluded for the night. The soonest a verdict could come is tomorrow. ABC's Steve Osinsami reports on the case once again for us. Say his name! There is so much concern about the demonstrations happening outside the Glynn County Courthouse that the judge moved jury deliberations to a quiet room that doesn't have any exterior windows. Jurors are deciding if Travis McMichael, his father Gregory McMichael, and a neighbor, William Roddy Bryant, will each be found guilty or acquitted on nine charges, including murder, aggravated assault, and false imprisonment. In Georgia, a murder conviction alone means a minimum of life in prison. Doesn't matter who actually pulled the trigger. Under the law, they're all guilty, even of malice murder. If a person is murdered in Georgia, the law says that the convicted getaway driver, for example, can be punished in the same way as the person who's convicted of the actual homicide. It's why William Roddy Bryant, who wasn't carrying a gun, but prosecutors say was part of the chase, could be in so much trouble. He and the others have pleaded not guilty. In her final words today, the prosecutor told jurors that without Bryant chasing the black victim with his pickup truck, Ahmaud Arbery would still be alive. Once Mr. Bryant turns around, he went up and down the street at least four times, confined and detained on homes. That's false imprisonment. No. Travis McMichael is seen on Brian's cell phone recording shooting Arbery dead in the street in February of last year. And prosecutors say that Arbery is dead because he's black. The three say the shooting was justified under a then citizen's arrest law. But Arbery has never seen stealing anything at the neighborhood construction site where he first raised their suspicions. 
Steve Osinsami joins us now. And Steve, it seemed like there was a little bit of confusion, a, a bit of whiplash right there at the end of the day today, where it seemed like maybe the jurors were close to a decision and then they decided to rest for the day. It did sound to some of us who were listening that they were close because the judge essentially asked the jury four person, who was a, a young woman who, who we, we learned this evening, he asked her essentially, are you close to a verdict? Is a verdict imminent and or should we break for the day? That four person's response was, we are working towards reaching a verdict, which sounded to some like they might actually potentially reach one tonight. But then at the same time, she said that they probably should take a break at that point. Then the jury four person left the room with the bailiff. The bailiff then comes back into the courtroom just two minutes later saying, no, they want to continue working. So that went on for about maybe 15, 20 minutes. Then the bailiff came back again and said that they decided they want to go home, home for tonight. So that really suggests that tomorrow it's possible, you know, we might, we might see a decision in this case. Right, it does seem very uh, likely potentially even. And of course, we're just two days away from the holiday. What's the scheduling for the jurors looking like if they don't reach a decision soon? So the plan is if they don't reach a decision by tomorrow, this court, the plan is that it will be closed on Thursday and that these jurors would then come back to the courthouse on Friday and continue deliberating again on Friday morning and possibly work through the weekend if need be. That are, that's already been, been, been discussed as well. Lindsay. All right. Okay. Steve Olson, tell me, thanks so much. And joining us now to help us read the legal tea leaves, if you will, is ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd, an attorney with the Cochran Law Firm. Shauna, thanks so much for being with us once again. First, just want to get your thoughts on the prosecutor's rebuttal to the defense's closing arguments. You know, Lindsay, I think she did a really good job. She was very methodical. She walked them through what the charges are going to be, what they were going to be charged with. She walked through each of the charges themselves, and she talked about the burden. She tied it to the evidence. I think she did a really good job because that's all the jury is going to be left with are those jury instructions. So to go through them ahead of time that methodically was a very good idea. I also think that her rebuttal was was amazing. She actually really went through each of the points that the defense made and she highlighted the inconsistencies or she highlighted the things that were contrary to whatever the defense closing statements were. So that's what a rebuttal is for and that is what it's exactly what it's supposed to do. And in her closing argument, the prosecutor seemed to really try to appeal to the emotions and, and almost the morality, if you will, of the jurors. I, I want to play this sound from the trial today. This isn't about whether these three men are good people or bad people. That's not what this is about. It's about responsibility. It's about holding people accountable and responsible for their actions. How important do you think it was for her to make that distinction for jurors? absolutely critical because what the defense did in their closing was they very much humanized these defendants and so anytime a jury may have some sort of emotional leanings or an emotional response to any of the defendants this was a very smart uh, a very uh, just really proficient way of separating the defendants from what the responsibility of the jurors are because they are not to look towards punishment they are not to consider it they're not to consider any of those other things those emotions that might tug at them when they're making this debate so she really put their responsibility back into framework by which they should be looking at all of this and that is in the terms of the responsibility according to the charges as listed in comparison to the Rittenhouse trial, where jurors only had to come to a decision about one person, how much more complex would you say this case is, given the fact that the role of each of these three men, uh, they're all distinctly different, they all have to be analyzed for the role that they played? Do you think that that could prolong deliberations beyond tomorrow? Typically, I would say yes, especially when the charges are different. But because the charges are the same and they all essentially start with the question of whether or not the jury believed they were acting under a citizen's arrest law, because that determines how much of their behavior was justifiable or not. So seeing as it comes back to that base question, I think it's actually going to make it a lot simpler for the jury to come to their conclusions, because the answer to that question is going to determine the others. Because if on one hand they were acting lawfully, then the felonies are going to drop off. If they were acting unlawfully, then they start addressing the individual charges. So I think that helps streamline this verdict a little bit more for this particular jury. 
And, and before I let you go, what did you make of that little backlash, or whiplash, I should say, with the jury uh, when they came back and it seemed like the four woman was, was ready to keep working tonight and then all of a sudden they, they dismissed them? You know, that's interesting, but if I was saying, if I'm reading the tea leaves according to my experience with juries, what that sounds like is they are probably relatively close to a verdict, but when she went back in there, there's probably a few that are definitely not on the same page. They wanted to sleep, take fresh eyes at it tomorrow, because it seems as though they are close. So it seems like I would guess they're down to maybe a couple of, a handful of the charges, maybe one or two, and it might be one defendant that they're more stuck on than the others. Crystal Ball, you think that they're going to come back with a verdict tomorrow? I think it's highly likely. I would put that if I was a betting woman, I'd put it at somewhere at about 87%. You're a betting woman. Okay. All right, Shauna Lloyd, we thank you so much for your time and insight as always. Always a pleasure, Lindsay. And when we come back, the deadly home explosion caught on tape. The blast felt for miles and the investigation now underway. NASA prepares to launch a daring space mission aimed at saving the planet. Think the movie Armageddon but in real life. But up next, burn pits. They were used in Iraq and Afghanistan to get rid of trash, but now those veterans who served in those conflicts say the pits are causing serious health issues. Our in-depth look, next. This is what being live is Three, all action. about. Rise, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Say it ain't so. Dollar Tree is announcing that its prices are going to go to $1.25 next year. The company says it's struggling to contain rising prices and that the price hike will help them sell more. Dollar Tree has been trying to keep products under $1 for the last 25 years. They are our men and women in uniform who bravely go where they're called to protect our democracy. But what happens if the mission abroad leads to chronic and even fatal disease once they return home? ABC's Stephanie Ramos brings us this report on the terrible health impacts of burn pits and the steps our government is now taking. You know, when I see an overly short haircut and somebody who's a little bit wound up, that feels like home. I love, I love Marines. 
Kate enlisted in the Marine Corps after graduating from college, deploying to Iraq in 2005. It gave me so much, opportunities to lead, opportunities to travel the world, a sense of purpose. Kate left the service in 2008. She went back to school, got her PhD in public health, married, and had a son. So they really but then, that. 10 years later, at the age of 38, yeah. she went to her doctor for an annual checkup and received devastating news. She sat us down and said, you do have breast cancer, it's stage four. They said it looked like I had been dipped in something. I had metastases throughout my skeletal system from my skull to my toes. Kate then reflected on her time at war. When I checked in at Fallujah, I originally was housed in this area where everybody was cleaning their air conditioners all of the time. We were cleaning this chunky particulate matter out of the filters. I wasn't concerned about it. Again, I was 25 and invincible. That particular matter, she believes, might have been the product of unfiltered trash fires, also known as burn pits, used by the military to dispose of waste, chemicals, and plastics, which potentially exposed anyone nearby to clouds of toxic fumes. So before you deployed, did anyone ever warn you about these burn pits? I definitely didn't know that I would leave my deployment with exposure risks. According to the U.S. Census, Kate is one of 3.8 million service members who deployed post 9-11. Advocates say eight out of 10 of those veterans were exposed to these burn pits, possibly causing serious illnesses. For years, the Veterans Administration hadn't acknowledged that people faced any long-term health risks after being exposed to burn pits, which affected what type of health care or disability they could receive. I went back and forth with the Veterans Administration for three years. Um, they, they denied my claim. They denied appeals. They said, you know, we're not, we're not approving claims for burn pits right now. But the Biden administration says they're working to change that. The administration establishing a new pilot policy for U.S. veterans who have been exposed to burn pits, especially those with constrictive bronchiolitis, lung, and rare respiratory cancers. When you have so many people who are veterans and have been exposed to this and come out with these chronic diseases, we can see the association. According to the White House, the Veterans Administration will now create presumptions of exposure when the evidence of an environmental exposure and the associated health risks are strong in the aggregate, but hard to prove on an individual basis. It's an issue close to President Biden's heart. It is not because my son died of glioblastoma disease of the brain went very, very healthy, but he lived in the plume of those burn pits for a long time. Currently, veterans have five years after they're discharged or released to make claims related to their service in Afghanistan or Iraq. And the Biden administration wants Congress to extend that timeline. But that doesn't help Kate now, who is using a private health care provider after years of rejected claims at the VA. She's hoping this policy eventually gets the green light so other veterans can get the help they need before it's too late. I worry about Matthew. I worry about him losing his mom at a young age and not having that person in his life who loves him, you know, unconditionally. It's not fair for him. Do you guys talk about it? We do, um, and it's interesting because he knows. The other day we were talking about Jesus and heaven and he had all these questions and then he got very still and his eyes filled up with tears and he looked at me and he said, Mom, it's going to be so sad. Stephanie Ramos, ABC News, Washington. So sad indeed. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the medical autopsy report on the death of Brian Laundry is out. What we now know about how the former boyfriend of Gabby Petito died. The fan now facing assault charges after a disturbing incident during a WWE event. And our friend and colleague Michael Strahan will soon blast off, becoming the latest space tourist. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the one and only Dick Vitale. We can't wait to see him back back in action once again on ESPN.
extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. Oh, my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, we are finding out more about the next civilians to get a chance to go to space, and our friend and colleague Michael Strahan is among them. Blue Origin will soon launch its newest mission. We take a look by the numbers. In T-minus 16 days, a crew of six, including Mr. Strahan, will blast off out of this world. It's the third human flight for Blue Origin. Four will be paying customers, including the first parent-child combo to fly to space. Blue Origin did not disclose just how much money they paid for the chance to be briefly in space. Base. Two, that's the number getting a free ticket to the stars. The lucky one, Strahan, and the daughter of the first American ever to fly to space, Alan Shepard. You may recall the second mission included Star Trek actor William Shatner, who became the oldest person to ever go to space. Strahan and the rest of the crew will go about three times the speed of sound, roughly 2,300 miles per hour. The flight will follow a similar path as the last two, spending just 10 minutes off the ground. Strahan says when Blue Origin and approached him, he said yes without hesitation. Only had to ask him one time. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. We talked so much in recent months about the mega drought out west, but has the recent uptick in rain made things any better? The investigation into the death of Malcolm X's daughter is now underway. What police believe happened to Malika Shabazz? Olivia Rodrigo breaking new ground will explain. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. Powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline.
Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Americans could soon be shelling out less cash at the gas pump. It will take time, but before long, you should see the price of gas drop where you fill up your tank. The president announcing he's tapping into U.S. oil reserves, releasing 50 million barrels of oil as more than 48 million people are expected to hit the road for Thanksgiving. The average gas price is roughly $3.40 a gallon, about a buck and a quarter more than it was this time last year. We filled up yesterday to get gas. It was $3.56 a gallon. It's been hard to spend it. Sometimes you don't even feel like going nowhere. 20 bucks don't get you nothing. President Biden is asking the Federal Trade Commission mission to investigate if oil companies are unfairly profiting from the situation considering the price of unfinished gasoline continues to decline. We now know the cause of death for Brian Laundry, found dead in Florida after a lengthy search and following the murder of his fiance Gabby Petito in Wyoming. Close to a month after a forensic anthropologist received Brian Laundry's remains, an attorney for the family says they have been informed the cause of death was a gunshot to the head and the manner of death was suicide. The attorney saying Laundry's parents hope the findings will bring the family closure. Laundry's remains were found in a swampy park in Florida in October. The medical exam examiner could not determine a cause of death, so they were sent to an anthropologist. Petito's family responded today saying that they will not make any statement while the FBI investigates at the request of the prosecutor's office. A deadly home explosion in Flint, Michigan. Surveillance video shows the blast happening late last night. A 55-year-old woman and a 4-year-old girl were killed. The girl's body recovered this afternoon. Her parents were hospitalized, her father in critical condition. The mayor says 30 homes and structures were damaged or destroyed. The blast felt for miles. The cause is still under investigation. A violent scene at a WWE event in New York. A 24-year-old fan attacked Seth Rollins just as Rollins was leaving the ring. Referees, security guards pouncing on the man, pummeling him, detaining him as Rollins got up furious, screaming at the man along with the fans who were surrounding the incident. And the first part of it aired on TV. As for last night's incident, the 24-year-old man was arrested, charged with attempted assault. The daughter of civil rights leader Malcolm X has died. Malika Shabazz was found dead in her Brooklyn home just before 5 p.m. Monday. The 56-year-old daughter of Malcolm X was discovered by her own daughter. A police official told ABC News the death does not appear to be suspicious. Family members told first responders she may have gotten sick from something she ate earlier in the day. And NYPD Commissioner Dermot Chase says the 56-year-old suffered a long-term illness before her death. It comes just days after two men convicted of the assassination of Malcolm X were exonerated. Prosecutors in Manhattan discovered new evidence that led them to conclude the men were convicted in error. 
The stage is set for music's biggest night, the Grammy nominations announced today. Leading the pack, John Baptiste scored the most nominations with 11, trailing just behind him with eight, Justin Bieber, Doja Cat, and Her. Rapper Jay-Z broke records with his three nominations today. He now holds the title for most Grammy nominations ever, with a total of 83 over the course of his career, passing Quincy Jones, who has 80. Another historic moment, Olivia Rodrigo became the first Filipina and second youngest artist to be nominated in all four top categories. Now I drive alone past your street. Several major categories also expanded to include 10 nominees instead of eight. Welcome back. Next to the mega drought on the West Coast, despite a recent uptick in rain, bone dry California still has a long way to go until it's out of the woods. And this impact of the, and the impacts of this major drought go far beyond the Golden State. Arcana Whitworth reports. With the challenges of the drought, you realize long term this thing could just get tougher and tougher. The country's most populated state already enduring its driest water year in nearly a century. Now, with more than 90% of the state in severe drought or worse. I'm a little bit fearful that uh, farming in California is going to be smaller, and it's not going to be what it was when my parents started this operation. It's, it's definitely going to change, and there's going to be fewer of us. Central California farmers, like Stuart Wolf, increasingly face tough choices, already pulling out 400 acres of almond trees. He didn't have enough water to keep them alive. So I got to figure out, what do I do with, with that land that sits idle now? Everyone should be concerned about this regional drought that's gripping the American West. California agriculture helps to feed not only the country, but the world. One quarter of America's food comes from California's Central Valley, including 40% of its fruits, nuts, and other table foods. The state's top agricultural export, almonds. Its $6 billion a year almond industry produces about 80% of the world's supply. California is the most efficient place in the world to grow almonds or pistachios or processing tomatoes. There's a whole slug of different crops that we enjoy higher yields, longer length of season. It's better in California than almost anywhere. The secret? It's one of the few places on Earth with a unique Mediterranean climate, suitable enough to produce more than 400 of these specialty crops. If the state's farmers produce less, it could result in families paying more at the grocery store. We're already seeing some of our, our crops, like tomatoes, just take off in terms of pricing because they have to compete for limited water a grower has. So these crops have to compete for water and then the consumer ultimately will as well. After California received below normal snowfall last winter, much of what did fall never even made it into reservoirs like Lake Oroville, just north of Sacramento. Warming winter temperatures and record spring temperatures meant more of that snow absorbed into very dry soils or evaporated into the atmosphere. Lake Oroville is the state's second largest reservoir, dropping to a record low this fall, less than 629 feet. Satellite images showing the level rapidly decreasing over the years. And it's not just there. It might be hard to tell, but right now I'm standing on the bottom of Folsom Lake. This year's historic drought so bad that many lakes and reservoirs in California are dropping well below 30% and in some cases revealing islands they've never seen before. And now, state officials are warning the tens of thousands of people who rely on Lake Mendocino that it could be the first major reservoir in modern times to run dry. Most states in the American West have natural cycles of drought. We experience these dry periods. But what's changed is that climate change is now supercharging these droughts. The highest level of the phenomenon known as an atmospheric river, described by some meteorologists as a firehouse of moisture in the sky. In late October, an atmospheric river bringing record-breaking rain, but still not enough to reverse the historically low water levels in the reservoirs. Throughout California, it's not just the farmers relying on water from these reservoirs. Millions of families also need the hydroelectric power they produce, plus fish and wildlife, all bearing the brunt of this drought. It's our communities, our economy, and our natural environment that are all 
threatened in real time from this drought. Today, I think my charge is to figure out how do I optimize the land that I don't have enough water to farm. The Wolf family now adapting to the new climate realities. In fact, leasing some of their empty land to solar power companies and planting drought tolerant agave plants. These plants require very, very little water. And so we can actually grow this out here and still have a little excess water. Our challenge is to figure out what is the new equation and the new crops that will allow us to stick it out for another generation. And hopefully we can stick it out for beyond that. Our thanks to Kena. And now time to get to some much needed, needed exciting news from NASA that one day might save the planet. Early Wednesday morning, NASA will launch a small spacecraft in a first of its kind attempt to move a small asteroid off course to see if it's possible if one day in the future it's needed. The experiment is called DART, short for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, NASA is just hours away from launching a bold space flight that could one day help save the planet. The DART mission, as it's known, will slam a spacecraft into an asteroid to knock it off course. Asteroid impacts into Earth are one of the only, maybe the only, natural disaster that we can predict very far ahead of time and that we can also do something about. It'll be the first time humans have ever tried to redirect an asteroid. And here's what it'll look like. About 10 months after launch, the spacecraft, which is about the size of a large vending machine, will reach the massive asteroid about 7 million miles away and crash into it at 15,000 miles per hour. Basically, we're, we're firing this vending machine at one of the pyramids of Egypt very, very fast. It won't destroy the asteroid, but NASA hopes that the high-speed collision will knock it off course just enough to prove we can keep asteroids away from Earth. And the asteroid NASA intends to hit and redirect is no threat to planet Earth, but what we learn from it could really protect us from any catastrophic collision later on. Lindsay? Geo, thank you. Now for more on this asteroid launch coming up for NASA, let's bring in Dr. Lori Glaze, who leads NASA's planetary science missions and programs. Welcome to the show, Dr. Glaze. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So the goal of this mission is going to be to deliberately crash a vending machine-sized craft into an asteroid and alter that asteroid's path. Explain why that's so important for life here on Earth. Exactly because there are, as we know, uh, asteroids that have impacted Earth in the past. We know we see these processes going on in the solar system uh, today, uh, across the solar system, uh, with meteorites that impact Earth. Um, and right now, there are no significant threats. We, of the asteroids that we know about, none of them are a significant threat. But what we really want to do here is to test this technique so that in the future, if a potential asteroid ever became a threat, that we would be prepared. We want to test this technique before we actually know there's a problem. So that's why we're, we're doing this test now, um, and it, it should help us be better prepared for the future. So this is like a trial run. Exactly, a trial run to see if we can, as you said, to, to slam or ram this, uh, like you say, vending machine sized spacecraft into uh, an asteroid that's about the size of a, a football stadium, like a high school football stadium, if you can imagine that filled with rocks. We're going to ram that uh, vending machine at 15,000 miles an hour. Well, we'll be watching this launch very closely. The major test really comes in that moment of impact next September, where I understand there will be a stream to watch. Describe what's going to happen and how we'll know if it's a success. So in about 10 months from now, in September, the, uh, the spacecraft is going to ram into the asteroid. Um, and it's going to, as it's heading into the asteroid, be taking image, images right up until the point where it uh, impacts. So we'll be sending those images back to Earth. And when we lose signal, uh, we'll know that that spacecraft has rammed in. In addition, we're carrying a small CubeSat that's going to be taking images of the impact and of any uh, material or debris that gets flown off uh, the asteroid. And so that'll be our, our information to tell us that we've successfully uh, rammed the spacecraft into this asteroid. Of course, we are not here to spread doom and gloom. And I, I do want to reiterate, there is no current threat. But can you walk our viewers through what the worst case scenario might be with an asteroid hitting Earth, what that might look like? So as you said, uh, of the asteroids that we know about, um, there are no 
significant threats over the next 100 years from any of those asteroids. Uh, but an asteroid of, of about the size of the one we're going to test the, the DART mission on, uh, the asteroid uh, Dimorphos, um, it's about the size of, of, a, of a high school football stadium. Um, that size asteroid could actually cause significant damage to a metropolitan area. Um, say, for example, the New York metropolitan area or the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And so uh, asteroids of that size um, could cause significant damage. And tell me about the actual craft itself and how it's built for a mission into space. So this particular spacecraft is built specifically for this mission. Um, it's actually uh, got a fair amount of mass on it, um, and it has one instrument. It only carries one piece of payload, and that's this uh, camera that's very, very high res resolution imager, very high precision camera, that we will use the images and process them on board the spacecraft and use special software um, called SmartNav that will autonomously navigate the spacecraft so that when it comes towards the spacecraft, towards the asteroid, we will target it and uh, impact at about 15,000 miles per hour. And this is, of course, the first ever spacecraft to not be guided by humans. This is really revolutionary technology. What does this mean for the mission and for NASA going forward? So this is a really important mission to test this technique. Uh, it's part of our overall planetary defense program uh, where we want to make sure that we are looking for and identifying potentially hazardous asteroids and comets that are out in our solar system. Once we find them, we characterize them. We want to uh, better understand what they're made of and what their orbits are so that we can better assess and predict if they might be hazardous in the future. Um, and so this is a really important part of that program. We also want to uh, test these techniques to help us better prepare to mitigate or, or protect ourselves if there were a hazardous asteroid in the future. For all those movie fans who remember Armageddon, humanity discovers an asteroid the size of Texas just 18 days away. While that, of course, is not a realistic scenario outside of Hollywood, what's the kind of lead time that NASA would need to actually successfully stop an asteroid that's heading toward Earth? That's a really great question, and it actually takes a fair bit of time. Um, we need the time, we need uh, years of, of observing to detect an asteroid, and then once we've detected one, if we're going to successfully mitigate, uh, we need to be able to get the spacecraft launched, if that's the technique we're going to use. And then this type of technique is going to make a very small change in the orbital period, the velocity or the speed of the asteroid, which if you have years in advance or decades in advance, you can make a very tiny change in its speed and over time, it'll have a big effect. So what we really want to happen is when the asteroid comes and it crosses over Earth's orbit, we want to be out of the way. We either are, we haven't arrived yet or we've already passed uh, when the asteroid passes through our orbit. So we just don't want to be there at the same time the asteroid arrives. Makes a lot of sense. We so appreciate you breaking it all down for us. Dr. Lori Glaze, NASA Planetary Science Director, overseeing the DART mission. We appreciate your time. It's my pleasure, thank you. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Talk about don't try this at home. The man called Spider-Man, complete with his super cool superhero suit, seen climbing a skyscraper illegally in Frankfurt as a man casually watches from his office. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Over the next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including the push to contain soaring prices on everything from gas to food. And our Jonathan Carl joins us to discuss his new book, Betrayal, looking at the final days of the Trump presidency. Stay with us. This is what being live is Freezer all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. 
How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A federal jury has found white nationalist defendants liable for more than $25 million for the Unite the Right Charlottesville rally that ended in bloodshed back in 2017. But the jury remained deadlocked on two key claims in the nearly month-long trial. And an update on a case that made national headlines a few years ago. Mark D'Amico has pled guilty to a $400,000 GoFundMe scam involving his ex-girlfriend and a homeless veteran. The couple was claiming to raise money for him, but instead spent it on a lavish lifestyle. D'Amico faces up to 20 years in prison. The other two pled guilty in 2019. And a major development in a story that we've been tracking closely, Kevin Strickland, who spent 43 years behind bars for a triple murder he did not commit. Today, he walked out fully exonerated and a free man. But we begin this hour with the rising death toll in Waukesha, Wisconsin, after that horrific scene at the Christmas parade there. The suspect is accused of killing at least six, including four who were part of a group called Grannies Who Dance. He appeared in court today. ABC's Alex Perez has the details. Tonight, with hands shackled and wearing what appeared to be a bulletproof vest, the man police say plowed into crowds at a Christmas parade in Waukesha, making his first appearance in court. 39-year-old suspect Daryl Brooks audibly sobbing in court when prosecutors announced a child had died and that they intend to charge him with six counts of intentional homicide. I wish to notify the court, sadly, that today we learned of another death of a child. A newly released criminal complaint saying an officer observed Brooks looking straight ahead directly at him and it appeared he had no emotion on his face when he plowed into parade goers and participants honking as officers yelled for him to stop. Authorities say the SUV appeared to rapidly accelerate and turn into the crowd, injuring 62 people. An officer saying it was clear this was an intentional act to strike and hurt as many people as possible. The nature of the this offense is shocking. And tonight, we're getting our first look at Brooks moments after the deadly chaos. This doorbell cam video capturing him knocking on a homeowner's door about a half mile from the parade route, asking for help with a ride. Hey, can I, I call some, I call the Uber, and I'm supposed to be waiting for it over here, but I don't know when it's coming. Can you call it for me, please? Minutes later, police arriving, arresting him. We're also learning new details about the six killed, three of them part of the Dancing Granny's marching group. Those three were marching right next to Dancing Granny Sharon Millard. She narrowly escaped, still in shock after finding her marching partner nearby. No one could find her anywhere. And as soon as everything cleared out, most of the people were gone. I spotted her and you could just see her blue dress 
hide against the doorway. Those little details just make it so difficult. Our thanks to Alex Perez. Next to the pandemic fight, COVID cases in children are rising at a concerning rate across the country, up 41% in the last three weeks as the push to vaccinate more students and give boosters to vaccinated adults continues. Ariel Reshef has more. Tonight, pediatricians warning COVID infections among children are once again on the rise, up 40% since late October. Nearly 142,000 new cases just last week. Over the past two to three weeks, we've seen a significant increase. It's just a little pinch and it'll be over quickly, okay? With children accounting for one in every four new COVID cases, there's a push to get more shots into arms. As much as we'd all love to be past this pandemic, we're not. And cases rising is always a concern. Kids are not as severely affected as adults, but they certainly can and do get hospitalized. In Virginia, eight-year-old Ashlyn South was hospitalized with that rare pediatric inflammatory syndrome weeks after her parents had COVID. She's always been our healthy kid. I just didn't think this could happen to us, and it did. 35 million children who are eligible are still unvaccinated. But tonight, there is more promising data on the vaccine in adolescence. Pfizer reporting its shots were safe and 100% effective at preventing COVID in 12 to 15-year-olds for at least four months. New COVID cases are ticking up across 32 states, with overall infections up 42% in the last four weeks. We're dealing with a much more contagious variant than we did before. Overwhelmed hospitals in Michigan reportedly asking the Pentagon for emergency staff. And in Minnesota, the National Guard now training teams to help ease nursing shortages. Ariel Reshef joins us now. And Ariel, hospitals in Michigan are sounding the alarm tonight about the strain on the health care system. What are they saying? Well, Lindsay, Michigan hospital officials say that there are just more patients in the ERs than they have rooms. In some cases, they are using hallways, conference rooms, and diverting patients altogether. They say things could get worse before they get better, and they are urging the public to get vaccinated. Lindsay? All right, Ariel, thank you so much. Next to the major step to lower the pain at the pump, President Biden announcing the release of 50 million barrels of crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the nation's emergency supply. But will it be enough? Rachel Scott has more. With Americans preparing for what could be the most expensive Thanksgiving yet, President Biden taking action today to blunt some of the pain at the pump. The bottom line, today we're launching a major effort to moderate the price of oil an effort that will span the globe in its reach and ultimately reach your, cor your corner gas station, God willing. For drivers, relief can't come soon enough. In just the past year, the average price for a gallon of gas has soared to $3.40. That's $1.29, higher than this time last year. The fill up my car is like $65. Khadijah Baxter and her four kids usually drive to spend Thanksgiving with family, but not this year. Riding around is a nose. You have to fill up again by the end of the week. Today, the president tapping into the nation's emergency reserve to help, releasing 50 million gallons of crude oil. The fact is we always get through those spikes, but we're going to get through this one as well and hopefully faster. But it doesn't mean we should just stand by idly and wait for prices to drop on their own. I press the energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm, on when Americans will feel the impact. So bottom line, how soon will Americans see prices at the pump drop and how long do you expect that to last? It won't happen tomorrow, but it'll happen over the next few weeks that people hopefully will start to see the difference. The administration acutely aware that inflation combined with shipping delays is hitting families hard. Today, word the shipping logjam may be easing. ABC's Kana Whitworth reports there's 33% less cargo sitting on the docks at the Port of Los Angeles, the nation's busiest. Port officials creating relief yards to house empty shipping containers, making space for new ones to be unloaded. And as this relief yard is already nearing capacity, they're looking to open another one right across the street to hold an additional 6,000 containers. Officials say the progress is clear to see. Two weeks ago, 101 ships waiting at the port. Today, that number down to 63. 
Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that. And joining us now is our chief Washington correspondent, Mr. Jonathan Carl. If news gets broken about the Trump administration, this is the guy to blame. He's been dropping headlines for weeks from his new book, Betrayal, the final act of the Trump show, diving into the final year of the Trump presidency and its aftermath. John, great to have you here on the show. Thank you, Lindsay. Great to be here. I want to take a step back and ask you, as someone who's covered Donald Trump for years, what was the most surprising thing you learned in your reporting for this book about the former president and his actions in the run-up to January 6th and the days after? The most surprising thing was how close we came to a much greater crisis. Uh, I mean, I, I knew it was bad. You and I uh, covered the day-to-day -day, uh, of the election and the aftermath and January 6th itself. Uh, but when I went, looked back and really tried to reconstruct every single day as the part of the initial reporting for this and to go back and, and to see what was what I didn't know at the time, to see what was happening behind the scenes, uh, it became obvious to me that there were many instances where things actually could have gone off the rails in a far more dramatic and profound way than they actually did. I'd like to pull up a quote from your book where you write about January 6th and you say, there are also those who say the violence that that day has been exaggerated, that there was no real threat to our democracy, that it was just a protest that got a little out of hand. That's a lie. January 6th was an attempt to overturn a presidential election. It was an assault on democracy itself. Uh, we've seen in the months since that day this attempt to whitewash what happened and to continue to lie about the, the 2020 election. And, and I want to ask has it worked? I mean, because we see poll after poll of Republican voters who today say that they believe the 2020 election was stolen. Um, it, it unfortunately, uh, in part, it has worked. But I, I think that, that I'm so glad that you pulled out that quote. This was an assault on democracy itself, because even those who acknowledge that it was a terrible thing, that rioters went in and assaulted, assaulted police officers, committed vandalism in the Capitol building, broke in where they shouldn't have been, you know, that is not all it was. That's terrible. Even if it's just what you're showing in those pictures there, that's terrible. But what made this so profoundly awful is the purpose behind it. It was not simply an effort to rampage and pillage and to, and to express, uh, you know, some kind of a, a violent protest. This was an effort to stop the movement of American democracy, to stop what is the essence of American democracy, which is a peaceful transition of power. And, you know, unfortunately, there is a wide segment of the population that not only looks back at that day and remembers something different than what actually happened, uh, but believes the lies that have been repeated so often uh, about the election being stolen. And I tried to, in this book, go in and address the reasons behind that disbelief, the reason uh, that so many people have come uh, to question whether or not the election uh, was really free and fair. And I think it's important that we do that. We don't just say, look, there's no evidence, it's all a big lie, big lie, big lie. Uh, we have to go through and explain uh, why the allegations that have been uh, repeated so often by Donald Trump uh, and people around him are simply not true. And you write about how in your conversations with him for this book, the former president actually seems to look back fondly on January 6th. How would you describe his demeanor and, and frankly, his mental state as you pressed him on that day? And, and what was your reaction as you heard his justifications and explanations? It's really quite striking. I, I tried to describe the entire scene, not just the words he said, but the environment. I mean, he brings me down to Mar-a-Lago, and I had never been to Mar-a-Lago before. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, we were sitting down in the middle of this ornate lobby with towering ceilings. And he, he has the interview conducted right in the middle of that lobby before dinner so that people can see him being interviewed as they come into dinner and a happy hour out on the patio outside. And, you know, he was very gracious. He offered me, as he always does, he orders a Diet Coke. He offers me one. Uh, you know, he makes some remarks about my previous book. And, um, you know, but he all, he seemed to be in, in, a, in, a, in a, actually quite a good mood. Um, and he seemed to have lost weight since he left the White House, all of that. And, and then, as I'm asking him about this day that I remember as one of the worst days that I've ever witnessed, in my lifetime, he 
is talking about them, about it as one of the best days of his presidency. And it's not something I really anticipated. We've heard him do it now in, in a few other uh, venues. Um, but he's saying it, and he seems rational, totally rational. He seems friendly. He's enjoying describing this horrific day <laughs> as one of the finest days of his presidency. Um, but the lack of any sense that there was something wrong, uh, I think, is delusional. There's no other way to say it. It's not that he seemed like he was out of his mind and he was ranting and raving. He actually seemed quite normal while he was saying this. Listen to the, the tape. That's why I wanted to put the tapes out there. Um, because he's talking about Mike Pence and, and, and the people saying, hang Mike Pence, the people calling for the execution of his vice president. And he's justifying their actions, but he's doing it in a very almost matter-of-fact way. It was bizarre. And, and while you say that he seemed quite normal, uh, the former president's mental state was something that you write about in the surrounding yeah. conversations on invoking the 25th Amendment by the cabinet after January 6th. What did you learn there on, on how members of his own administration viewed him and, and what they were considering doing? We, we had heard at the time, and, and I had reported on, on ABC that night that there were discussions, but, you know, frankly, we didn't have the details about what those discussions were, so I spent a lot of time trying to go back and finding out what was going on. And the most surprising thing to me was that two of his most prominent cabinet members were part of those discussions. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, who had known Trump for years before uh, he took that job, and Mike Pompeo, the, the Secretary of State. And, and they both, they had discussions that night. Neither one of them talked to Trump. Neither one of them thought to reach out to Trump. Neither one of them tried to reach out to Trump to tell him to, you know, to get out and call the, the riots off. Pompeo was actually in Washington at the time. Uh, Mnuchin was traveling in the Middle East. Um, but they, they were discussing this and, and, and with other cabinet members, and I learned that Pompeo had actually uh, requested a legal analysis of it to be done. But it quickly became moot because two cabinet members who they would need as votes to declare him mentally incompetent uh, resigned the very next day, uh, Betsy DeVos and, 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 uh, and Elaine Chao. Uh, so it became moot. There were also questions about whether or not it would face legal uh, challenge. It almost certainly would. It probably wouldn't have been able to get him out of office timely enough. And now, you know, they all pretend like it didn't happen, um, that they never challenged, they never questioned his mental fitness. But they did. Trust me, they did. And you write also about a conversation that you had with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy days before mm -hmm. January 6th, where you asked him if he would stand up to Trump's lies about the election, and he essentially told you it wasn't worth it politically. Since then, we've certainly seen some Republicans try to keep Trump at an arm's length, but, but much of the party is still embracing him. Do you see anything that might change that? I, I do. I think that Trump's relentless focus on the past is it spooks uh, Republican leaders. I think if you got McCarthy and you, you know, gave him some truth serum and, and forced him to answer the questions, uh, that, that, that he would express real concerns about what Trump's behavior might, might mean to his efforts to regain uh, Congress uh, uh, next year. Uh, all, all things look good for Republicans politically. They won uh, in Virginia. They almost they got a lot closer to winning in New Jersey in those two off-year uh, elections. But they did it with candidates that either ignored Trump, stood away from Trump, or actually said that they were opposed to Trump in the case of, of, of Cittarelli in New Jersey. Uh, but, you know, he's got a tremendous hold on the party because he still does have a very high level of support on rank-and-file Republican voters, and that's why somebody like Kevin McCarthy uh, feels that he cannot come out and directly stand in opposition to Trump. And considering that, I mean, you've reported here before how most people around Trump believe that he will try to run again in 2024, but you've said that ultimately you don't believe that he will. Why is that, given the hold that he still clearly has on so many party members as well as Republican supporters? Uh, before I answer that, let me say a caveat. He may well run. Uh, so this is not a hard and fast prediction. I just think it is more likely that he does not run than, than, than he would run. Uh, and I think it's because he does not want to face the possibility of losing again. And, you know, Trump is not a dumb man. Uh, he, he can look at facts. He can, he can ignore those facts, as he often does, and he can say things that are not true. But he knows that there is a real uh, possibility, I would say, a, you know, I mean, a very, very high possibility. There is, like, no way he could get elected again because he has done so much to alienate everybody but that core base Republicans, especially after January 6th. 
Uh, so I don't think he wants to face the prospect of losing. And also, uh, you know, l look at some of the tea leaves out there. All he talks about is the past. He doesn't talk about the future. He's entirely focused on 2020. And what did he just do? Uh, his company, they're, they're, they're selling the Trump International Hotel in Washington. Trump loved having that hotel just down the road from the White House and, you know, did events there frequently and used it, used it frequently. Now he's selling it. Doesn't sound like a guy to me that has his eyes on coming back to Washington. But that said, he certainly wants us, Lindsay, to believe he's running again, because that's the key to his relevance. Uh, so, uh, you know, I believe he won't run, but I also believe that he won't actually let us know that he is not running until the very last minute. We shall see. All right, Jonathan Carl, Betrayal, the final act of the Trump show is available for purchase wherever books are sold. Thanks so much for your time, John. Thank you, Lindsay. And still ahead, what are the things that we have lost to the Internet? Stay with us. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc. Subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The U.S. government is warning all Americans to get out of Ethiopia as the African nation lurches toward possible civil war. Rebel Tigray and fire, uh, uh, fighters continue their advance toward the capital city of Addis Ababa. The U.S. is seeking a diplomatic solution, but there are fears that escalating violence could undermine any ceasefire. Nearly 50 people are dead after a bus turned into a ball of fire in Bulgaria. The bus, which departed from Istanbul on Monday, crashed into a roadside barrier. Seven people who leapt from the bus were rushed to the hospital and remain in stable condition. And in Italy, the only person convicted in the 2007 murder of British student Meredith Kircher is free after serving most of a 16-year sentence. Rudy Gaudet was found guilty in the Perugia killing and as and was American as was American exchange student Amanda Knox and her then boyfriend. Both of their convictions were later thrown out. Joining us now is Pamela Paul, editor of the New York Times Book Review and author of the new book, 100 Things We Lost to the Internet, where she takes a deeper look at the many intersections between technology and our lives, breaking down what these changes may mean both for the present and the future. Pamela Paul, thanks so much for speaking with us tonight. My pleasure to be here. 
So criticism of the internet can jump rather quickly to doomsday like world ending scenarios. Yet in your book, you really choose to focus on the topics that are affecting our day to day. What led you to take this kind of approach? Well, I think when we think about the internet, we are often in fast forward motion, right? We're thinking about what's next, what's this new app, what does it mean for tomorrow, for next week, for next year? And we also tend to think really big. We think, what does this mean for democracy? What does this mean for privacy? And I wanted to do two things. I wanted to bring that, all, that conversation down to the level of what does this mean for me in my everyday life? What does it mean that I wake up to an alarm on my iPhone and I go to sleep or try to go to sleep and fail to do so because I'm thinking about what new messages are coming in, what, you know, who hasn't responded yet to an email, who is liking a photo that I posted. And I wanted to think about sort of how we got here, but then also to think about what did we used to do before we spent all our time doing this? So to really kind of scroll back and think about what have we lost in the process of what we've gained and to go back a little bit in time. I mean, it's crazy that it's only been 20 years, but things have changed so quickly that we've kind of forgotten the things, whether they're physical objects like a Rolodex or more conceptual things like the blind date that have just completely fallen into the way past. I'm sure there are so many young people out there that are thinking of Rolodex. Now, what might that be? How can someone practice more self-awareness when it comes to their dependency on the internet or social media when they have such a hold on our day-to-day -day lives? Well, I'm as guilty as anyone, so I know that it's hard. I think one thing is to sort of change your mindset, to think, to realize that technology really is an industry. It's not necessarily the future. It's not necessarily inevitable. It's a lot of products and services and apps that are sold to us. Now, they're often sold as free. Of course, we know that they're not actually often free and that there is a cost, even if it doesn't come directly out of our wallet. And then to be more skeptical consumers of it. So to think about any new app or new technology or way of living through the screen as we would about a new skin cream or about a new fashion style. Like I can buy this, I can opt in, or I can opt out. And to just sort of bring that awareness that actually we have a choice. As we move further and further away from the pre-internet age, we have entire generations unaware of what many of the losses that you describe even look like. Does that concern you? You know, I, it doesn't, I actually thought of this book could be a primer to, uh, for many sort of digital first, digital natives um, of the things that, that, that used to be in the before times. And I think there's actually a lot of evidence among young people that, uh, that, that some of those things that we've lost maybe aren't so bad. I mean, if you go into the average um, mall store that's popular with teenagers, you will see little turntables that are being sold. You will see a resurgence of vinyl. There are apps that actually mimic having to wait for your film to develop. Um, so I think that uh, it's, it's interesting for that generation to kind of get that perspective. And I also think it's interesting that the 80s and the 90s are so popular among that generation. I think that there's a kind of yearning for a simpler time. Kids get tired of being on screen all day the same way that we do. Retro has gone digital, I guess, in, in some ways that you describe there. I want to read a quote from your chapter, Empathy, where you say, the Internet ignores or undermines components of human existence, such as empathy, deep relationships, child development, family harmony, sustained conversation, compromise. Its products and services have been almost entirely developed by single 20-something men whose motives, no matter how pure, are primarily based on money and power. With these motives in mind, do you feel responsible Internet usage is even possible. I do think it's possible. You know, I think that, again, it's a really hard sell. And the tough thing about it, right, is that we have really internalized the message that the industry sends us, which is that if you choose not to do something online, if you choose not to use an app, that you are somehow a Luddite or denying the future, that you're not learning 21st century skills, that's a marketing message like any other. And we can say to ourselves, actually, there are other ways of doing things. There are, there, these are choices that we can make. Lastly, having written this book and taken the time to, to so heavily reflect on the Internet and its impact, are there any changes that you've made personally in terms of your own relationship with technology? 
You know, it's funny, when I think about when there's a new app or a new service, I think, will this substantially improve my life? Is there a reason for me to do this? Am I unhappy with the way things are now? So for example, with like Zenmo or Zelle, am I unhappy writing a check? Am I unhappy saying to a friend, you know what, I'll treat you this time. We don't have to split it uh, by using an app and then you can treat me next time. And often the, the answer is no, you know, that, and I also think that we can, divide our lives, right? We can use technology where it serves us. So for me, as a journalist, technology is hugely important and I do everything I can to employ all of the technological advances that um, that are offered to journalism. In my personal life, I often think, well, this is the kind of antidote to that very high tech um, day job uh, life that I have. And I can choose to, instead of catching up in a group text to say, you know what, let's actually meet for like a real life coffee. Pamela Paul, editor of the New York Times book review and author of the new book, 100 Things We Lost to the Internet. We thank you so much for your time. The book is now available wherever books are sold. Thank you so much. And finally tonight, some young people doing some amazing things. ABC's Will Gans shows us how kids are helping those who are less fortunate this Thanksgiving. This holiday week, proof that you're never too young to give back. Eight-year-old Belmont Schwartz serving up more than these sweet dance moves in honor of Thanksgiving. The third grader from Mansfield, Massachusetts, organizing a massive drive for his hometown's food pantry. There are a lot of people who don't have food, and I just want to help them in any way I can. Belmont launching his big project after seeing homeless people on a trip to California. He saw tents out there, and he was just kind of shocked by it. Belmond asking friends and family to donate and calling up local stores like Walmart, Stop and Shop, and Target. I think this will keep us pretty well stocked through January, mid-February. He turns nine years old just after Thanksgiving, and he says he already got his birthday wish. I don't want any presents. And, and like, I think that if I help people, well, then it would make me feel good. Meanwhile, one teenager in Chandler, Arizona, helping send elementary school students into the holiday season in style. 17-year-old Sam Bregman collecting thousands of dollars in donations over the last several months to purchase hundreds of shoes wholesale. So inside, we have a letter to each student, and then under is the pair of sneakers. 400 pairs of brand new shoes. A welcome surprise for the kids at San Marcos Elementary School, where more than 40% of students come from low-income households. Sam and his team giving back this Thanksgiving week. You know, all these kids look at them, man. They're all happy, and that's all we could do is bring them happiness, you know? Heartwarming kindness there. Our thanks to Will Gans for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to